Hello it's me Hiaska for Marijuana Garden. Self-mummification The first person who aspired to become a living mummy was a man named Kukai, later known as Kobo Daishi. Kukai was a Buddhist priest who lived more than 1,000 years ago in Japan. During his lifetime, he founded the Shingon, True Words, a new sect of Buddhism. A Shingon monk could easily be found sitting for hours under an ice-cold waterfall, ignoring his body's needs while meditating. Inspired by tantric practices from China, Kukai decided to take his ascetic lifestyle to the extreme. His aim was to leave behind the restrictions of the physical world and become a Sakushin Batsu. To achieve this, Kukai took certain measures that turned his body into a mummy while he was still alive. For over five years, the aspiring Sakushin Batsu eats almost nothing, engages in almost no physical activity, and endures long hours of meditation. It's probably safe to assume that only few people have the self-control and willpower to suffer this way for up to 2,000 days. There are three stages, each lasting 1,000 days, that ultimately lead to a mummified body. During those roughly nine years, the monk is alive for most of the time. After the monk decides to attempt self-mummification, he enters the first stage. Stage 1 The monk completely changes his diet, the key element of the process is dietary. Japanese ascetics would commonly abstain from cereals, removing wheat, rice, foxtail millet, proso millet, and soybeans. Instead, they would eat things like nuts, berries, pine needles, tree bark, and resin which is why the diet of the Sakushin Batsu was called makijikyo, or tree eating. This restricted diet is combined with a rigorous schedule of physical activity. During these first 1,000 days, the monk rapidly loses body fat. Mummification needs dry conditions to take place, the drier, the better. But body fat has high water content that causes quicker decomposition after death. Corpses with a lot of body fat also retain heat for a much longer time. Heat leads to better reproduction of the bacteria that promote decomposition. The monk's loss of body fat is the first step in his fight against the body's decomposition after death. Stage 2 The next stage is marked by an even more restricted diet. For the next 1,000 days, the monk only eats bark and roots in gradually diminishing amounts. Physical activity is replaced by long hours of meditation. As a result, the monk loses even more body fat and muscle. These efforts to become emaciated ultimately combat the body's decomposition after death. Bacteria and insects are the two main factors involved in the decomposition of a body. After death, bacteria within the body start to break down cells and organs. Although these bacteria cause the body to disintegrate from inside, the soft and fatty tissues of the dead body are also an invitation for flies to lay their eggs. Maggots soon hatch and feast on a diet of rotting flesh mixed with fat. At the end of the process, all soft tissue has completely vanished, leaving only the bones and teeth of the dead body. The monk's extreme diet literally takes away the critter's food. The second 1000 days of asceticism leave the monk's body emaciated. As body fat drops to a minimum, constant meditation and almost no physical activity leads to the loss of muscular tissue. But the monk still isn't satisfied and takes his ruthless diet even further. During his final steps to becoming a Sakushin Batsu, the monk drinks tea made from the sap of the Urushi tree. Usually, this sap of toxic Adendron vernicifluum is, is typically used to make lacquer and used as a varnish for bowls or furniture. It is highly toxic, drinking the Urushi tea quickly leads to heavy vomiting, sweating, and urination. This dehydrates the monk's body and creates ideal conditions for mummification. In addition, the poison from the Urushi tree builds up in the monk's body, killing maggots and insects that may try to infest the body after death. After 2,000 days of torturous fasting, meditation, and the consumption of actual poison, the monk is ready to leave this plane of existence. The second stage of Sakushin Batsu ends with the monk climbing into a stone tomb. The tomb is small, barely allowing him to sit. The walls and ceiling are so narrow that the monk is unable to stand or even turn around. After the monk assumes the lotus position, his assistants close the tomb, literally burying him alive. Only a small bamboo tube connects the tomb with the outside world to grant the monk some air. He sits in his dark, narrow hole with only a small bell as a companion. Each day, the monk rings the bell to let his assistants know that he's still alive. When the assistants no longer hear the bell, they pull the bamboo tube from the tomb and completely seal it up, leaving the monk in what has now become his grave. 
the monks would die in a state of jhana, meditation, while chanting the Ninbatsu, a mantra about Buddha, stage 3 in the final 1000 days, the sealed tomb is left alone while the body inside turns into a mummy. The low body fat and muscle tissue prevent the normal putrefaction of the body. This is supported by the dehydration of the body and the accumulation of urushi. The monk's body dries up and slowly mummifies. After 1000 days, the tomb is opened and the mummified monk is removed from his dying place. His mortal remains are returned to the temple and worshipped as a Sakushin Batsu, a living Buddha. The monk will be admired and cared for. The priests even go so far as to change his clothes every few years so that the new Buddha will look his best. Sad part is the monk, whether he has ascended to a higher plane of meditation or is really just dead will never recognize his own success. Despite all his efforts, the monk's body might decompose inside its tomb. In these cases, the monk would not be revered as a living Buddha. His remains would simply be reburied. However, he'd be highly respected for his endurance 